Hello and welcome back to the channel. This is the House of Law. Several weeks ago, I uploaded a video called Statutory Construction, Finding the Real Intent of the Law. In that video, I discussed some of the common tools on statutory construction to better understand the intent of our legislators. In today's video, I will show you some examples of how bad sentence construction can cause confusion and even death. And I also made some suggestions on how to better write laws. So let's begin. So first, what is statutory construction? It is the art or process of discovering and expounding the meaning and intention of the authors of the law with respect to its application to a given case, for that intention is rendered doubtful, among others, by reason of the fact that the given case is not explicitly provided for in the law. So, what is the best, if not the most basic tool in interpreting statutes, laws, and uh, other measures? Well, the rule is verbal lehis, or the plain language rule. Under this rule, if the language of the statute is plain and free from ambiguity and expresses a single, definite, and sensible meaning, that meaning is conclusively presumed to be the meaning which the legislature intended to convey. But what is a vague statute, or when does a statute become vague? A statute or act may be said to be vague when it lacks comprehensible standards that men of common intelligence must necessarily guess at its meaning and differ as to its application. So why do we have to guess what the law means? Well, the reason is that the law is poorly drafted. You know, the law has its own language altogether. Thus, correct grammar and sentence construction could have spared us all of the trouble. Let me give you an example. And this is the legend of Sir Roger Casement, the man who was hanged on a coma. From askfuntrivia.com, here is his story. Sir Roger Casement was charged with high treason contrary to Treason Act 1351 English 43. It was alleged that during World War I, he incited and convinced British subjects who were prisoners of war in Germany to renounce their allegiance to the king. The statute declared that treason was committed if a man do levy war against our lord the king in his realm, or be adherent to the king's enemies in his realm, giving to them aid and comfort in the realm or elsewhere and thereof be properly attainted of open deed by the people of their condition. The charge alleged adhering to the king's enemies elsewhere than in the king's realm, namely in the empire of Germany. Remember, he was accused of convincing and inducing British soldiers who were prisoners of war in Germany to renounce their allegiance to the king and, of course, supporting the enemy. Okay. But the defense submitted that the crown had failed to prove an offense in law. Its contention is that those words or elsewhere, which would cover Germany, govern only the words aid and comfort in the realm, but not to the words be adherent to the king's enemies in his realm. Let us look at the legal definition again and what the uh, the accused wanted to say. So, treason was committed. First act is, if a man do levy war against our lord, the king in his realm. The second act is, to be adherent to the king's enemies in his realm. And this is the act for which the accused was charged. And lastly, giving to them aid and comfort in the realm or elsewhere. So, he was accused charged and convicted of being adherent to the king's enemies elsewhere. Germany. The crime was allegedly committed in Germany and therefore is covered by the Treason Act. But that is not the position of the accused. The accused says the word elsewhere does not refer to adherent to the king's enemies but rather to giving aid and comfort to the enemies 
which was not the crime charged. So what a difference a comma can make. The judges who tried Sir Roger Casement ruled that the word elsewhere applied to all acts of treason, not just giving aid and comfort. Accordingly, the words or elsewhere were separated by a comma from the other words in the definition, thus they can refer to these words as well. These words would apply to all previous words. Thus, if a man do levy war against our Lord the King in his realm or elsewhere. Also, the second act would have to be read to be adherent to the king's enemies in his realm or elsewhere. And, of course, giving to them aid and comfort in the realm or elsewhere, which is what is provided in the Treason Act. Despite Sir Roger Casement's arguments on the basis of legal hermeneutics, he was executed. Thus, the moniker hanged on a comma. If that comma was not there, then maybe he could have won his case, because clearly the words or elsewhere would only refer to its last antecedent, which would be giving aid and comfort to the enemy. He was charged for another act, okay, but since it was committed in Germany, the accused claimed that he should not be covered by the law. Now, if this happened today, here in the Philippines, at least I can say with confidence that he could be acquitted. Why? Because in the Philippines, we have the presumption of innocence. And this presumption of innocence goes also into the application or interpretation of the law. So the rule has always been that in case of doubt or ambiguity in the law, resolve the doubt or ambiguity in favor of the accused. So if this confusion happened today, then the accused can claim or can use that presumption in his favor that that doubt should be resolved in favor of his acquittal, that he should not be covered by the law when it is unclear. So clearly we have confusing laws. And these confusing laws can be clearer okay, if we just follow some of these basic steps or basic tips in good and effective legal writing. So first, we should write to express, not to impress. The purpose of drafting laws is to make sure that people are informed and that they are able to follow and observe these laws on their own without need of going to a lawyer or going to court. So, the law should side with simplicity rather than complexity. Our legislators should endeavor to be more expressive and informative rather than, you know, seeking compliment or flattery because of their comp complex use of words in their legal measures. Next is use simple and generally known words, especially in the Philippines where English is not the native language. Not all Filipinos can understand, you know, very complicated and very advanced English. So the simpler the better because after all, these laws are geared towards simple or ordinary understanding and compliance. Next, avoid complex and long sentences. The problem with our laws is that they are too long. There are so many words. There are so many compound sentences, dependent and independent clauses in these legal provisions. So that's why they get lost in translation, so to speak. Next is use punctuation correctly. As shown in the case of Sir Casement, the punctuation caused confusion and in fact his death. But are we to blame the judges? No. We are to blame the crafter or the drafter of the law. So if we can use punctuations correctly, you know, by putting commas, semicolons in case of choices, and of course a period just so there won't be any dangling words or expressions, then we can reduce confusion. 
in these laws. Also, observe correct pronoun references. You know, some enumerations in the law can include men and women, singular and plural numbers. So, by using the correct pronouns, then we can use or find the references for these pronouns and therefore avoid confusion. Next is edit and write. You know, the, the rule of thumb has always been if it doesn't sound right, it must be wrong. Okay? Now, the problem with the law has always been it's confusing legalese and we are all supposed to know it. So, here's an example I found from the internet. So, it was a class in contract law and one day the professor asked one of his better students, Now, if you were to give someone an orange, how would you go about it? So, the, stu the student replied, Well, here's an orange. The professor was livid and he said, No, no, no. Think like a lawyer. And so, the student recited, Okay, I'll tell him. I hereby give and convey to you all and singular my estate and interests, rights, claim, title, claim and advantages of and in said orange together with all its rind, juice, pulp, and seeds, and all rights and advantages with full power to bite, cut, freeze, and otherwise eat the same or giving the same away with and without the pulp, juice, rind, and seeds, anything herein before or herein after or in any deed or deeds, instruments of whatever nature or kind whatsoever to the contrary in any wise notwithstanding. How sad! You know, this very long answer, this very long statement could have just been simply three words here's an orange and it could have conveyed the same meaning but unfortunately the law wants us to speak in this manner in this tone or using these words and there lies the problem if we cannot simplify our law then we can expect confusion if we continue to write our laws in a complex manner like this way then we can expect confusion we can expect uh, laws being misinterpreted and worse we can expect people wrongly prosecuted or wrongly adjudged for something that is not clearly within the law and that's it i hope you learned something new today especially about statutory construction and how bad sentences or the lack of punctuations or even the wrong use of punctuations can cause some confusion and hopefully in the future it won't cause death you know so if you like this video please don't forget to give it a thumbs up now please subscribe and click that notification bell to support me and also for you to know if i have uploaded a new video so till the next video thank you and goodbye